one of the things that I noticed, a couple of things, uh, there's a balance in your work. The it's balance right, of the imbalance. The balance <laughs> of the politics, which is heavy as a theme, but there's also a great uh, deal of craft um, that is wedded with it. Um, when when you're writing, is this something that, that you think about in terms of your approach? Because of course. I, I notice, especially as we're doing this issue on social justice, often well-meaning people write um, poetry <laughs> that, yeah, it's speeches, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's it becomes rants. Yeah. Um, who are your models for that? For writing in such a way yes. where you have the balance between art yes. and content? Yes. Um, there's so many. I mean, you know, um, Roy K. Dalton was a great one. You know, a uh, great poet, leftist from Nicara um, El Salvador. Um, Ernesto Cardinal of Nicaragua. You know, Pablo Neruda, of course. Um, Sonia Sanchez, Amiri Baraka, mm. Jane Cortez, uh, Haki Matabuti, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, um, Luis Rezavera, Sandra Maria Estevez, Pedro Pietri, Victor Hernandez Cruz, you know, um, Miguel Pinero, you know, all these different various writers. Um, so they your, they your and, heroes? And on and on and on and on. These, they, are, these are predecessors. These were, come before me. Were these your heroes? They were my heroes coming up, you know, James Baldwin, you know. Um, I mean, I really like, uh, when I was a, uh, started reading, you know, I was a teenager, my favorite writer, you know, was, and, you know, he's one of my favorites still, Kurt Vonnegut Jr., hmm. you know. Um, how, how, did you, how did you come to poetry? I came to poetry um, after three solid years of reading a lot of fiction, a lot of non-fiction, a lot of, um, as a teenager, a lot of literary criticism, plays, um, interviews of writers. You, you were reading literary criticism as a teenager? Yeah, once I fell in love with writing, I just went crazy wow. and I said, well, I want to be a writer. So once I fell in love with a writer, let's say John Steinbeck, I would read Of Mice and Men. And then I read everything that Steinbeck wrote. And then I wanted to read everything that was written about Steinbeck. <laughs> and then I wanted to read interviews of Steinbeck or let's say Salinger or Philip Roth or John Irving. These were the writers that I was reading at the time. You know, then Baldwin and then Alice Walker and, you know, on and on. And Toni Morrison, you know. Uh, what? Uh, I mean, I was, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always reading. I've been reading forever since I was 15 years old. Before that, I didn't have books at the house. So it's, I'm an anomaly in that sense. I wish <laughs> I had books when I was a kid, but we didn't have it. What was it like growing up? I mean, did you, always, was great. did you always envision being a poet? No, it wasn't until poetry grabbed me in a headlock, you know, at the age of 18 when I was a senior in high school, and poems just started coming into my head, and, and I wrote it down, and I said, well, this is a poem. I got to go and uh, do something about this. And one of the other things I noticed uh, in, in uh, the Broke piece is humor. It's funny. Uh, yeah, I was a born comedian. My whole family is, is all comedians. <laughs> uh, is that something that you uh, you think about when you're writing the pieces? Is that I want to make no, this piece funny? No, it comes. It, the content dictates, you know, what's gonna, what direction it's gonna go. I mean, I don't deliberately try to be funny, so, you know, most times. I mean, I do try to, you know, stick it in uh, here and there with satire and stuff like that, um, but. I'm not sure if it's that much of a conscious thing, but it's part and parcel of my uh, personality and the way I think and how I perceive things. Do you, have, do you have any concern that uh, perhaps people will be laughing so much that they might miss uh, the more serious points you're trying to make in the pieces? No. They can always go back and read it and stuff like that. I mean, you gotta, you got to, like... Um, I mean, we are, as artists, as, as um, literary artists, we are in the business of entertaining people, even the most serious. You know, it's about entertaining. You, you, you're trying to affect people's imagination. You, you know, you're forming this, this intimate bond between, you know, your yeah. written words and thoughts and images with, you know, yeah, a reader. It's funny you say that, man, because I don't see you as an entertainer, you know? I mean, 
You don't um, see me as the no. Shecky Green of I mean, the you're funky cold and everything, and that's cool. <laughs> But no, I don't see you as somebody I trying don't, to I don't please mean, a crowd. I don't mean entertainment in that sense. Not that you couldn't, but I'm just. I I'm mean just, that these are all art is all entertainment. You know, the highest forms of art to the lowest forms of art. It's all stimulating the imagination and the brain and, and but, your senses. So but, it's, yeah, but it's but all entertainment. You were saying things that are, for many people, very difficult to take. I don't know. What will be difficult to take? The idea that the CIA is orchestrating wars on foreign shores. Oh, well, everybody knows about the CIA and the no, no, FBI. No, 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 I mean, the whole world knows about that. Some people may not know, or or, or be willing to even entertain that idea. But, but, yeah, because but, we're, we're we're taught to be dumb in this country. But, we're like we have the most access to information out of probably any country in the world, but we we walk around like an ostrich. Imagine you your head is stuck in the sand and you're trying to walk around. That's 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 funny, right? When I never I never just curious, that. right? <laughs> but yo, when I listen to when I can listen to radio, especially mm -hmm. black radio, it's painful. It really is because well, they have good black talk shows, you know. Yes, but for the most part, on commercial black radio. Oh yeah, they get it's, it's all, a minstrel show, man. It's, it's all a contest silly, huh? of buffoonery, you know. And uh, well, sometimes you do get. When there's certain situations like the Genesis 6 incident that took place um, about, what, five years ago or so? Right. You do start to get um, more serious things. Or when Obama was, um, President Obama was running and campaigning in 08, you do get a little bit of serious stuff coming through the morning talk shows. But they're the, those shows are designed to, to wake people up and to entertain them. And, but see, that's what I think of when I think but of But then you have the other ones on the AM dial and on the um, satellite uh, radio where you have serious talk and serious political stuff, like the Joe Madison show that broadcasts out of D.C., but it goes all over the world, or, you know, other NPR shows where you get serious conversations and content and, and news items and things like that. But and then whatever's on the satellite stations, that's probably, like, such so much stuff. But when, when you talk about um, poverty, and when I look at um, our people especially, they're not listening to serious radio. You know, well, they're not listening. Not they're, everybody, but, but what I'm saying is some people the are. The people who are really struggling, the people impacted by racism, listen, at least from what I have observed, to commercial radio, a couple of stations in the area. And unless it's some earthquake of catastrophic proportions in terms of social justice, like Gen 6, mm -hmm. they're not really paying attention. You know, when I think of your work, you know, I'm reminded of Miles Davis. Well, a lot of people are not reading seriously. True. Either. When I think of your work, I think of uh, Miles Davis turning his back on the crowd, you know? People used to think that he was trying to diss the audience that were predominantly white, but it was because he liked the, the sound quality from that angle coming off the walls, actually. Where do you like to write? I can write anywhere. Hmm. You know, but I like to be where I'm, where I'm most comfortable at home or whatever, you know, like wherever I make home. But when I was... Um, you know, I'm in the D.C. area now because I teach at Howard University. Mm -hmm. But when I was in New York, I did a lot of my writing, um, riding the subways and the buses and stuff. Because uh, uh, for some reason, the movement and stuff in that, that time, I don't like to be, I wouldn't like to be sitting in a train for an hour and a half staring at people or whatever, or just trying to avert their eyes <laughs> or looking, you know. I would be reading a book or writing. Okay. You know, I've, I've written a lot of poems, you know, on the edges of newspapers or a notepad or whatever, or, you know. Have you written on the subways here? No, I haven't, I haven't written the, sub, the metro system here that extensively. I'm, I'm in so car what's, culture So what's wrong, what's wrong with our subway, man? Hey, I'd rather get a car, you know. <laughs> it's not like the New York. New York, you can get anywhere. I could walk places in New York, you know. Over here, it's like... Yeah, I, I find it. I have to jump on the back of a of a, of a deer and you know, <laughs> gallop away. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Um, you know, it's funny that it's it occurs to me that some of the poets who've had the most profound impact on poetry in the Washington metropolitan area are transplanted New Yorkers. Think of E. Ethelbert Miller. Because we're rough. No. <laughs> and you, both mm. skinny. We're skinny. We're we're agile. The agile man. We're, we're signifiers. Uh, we could talk about your mama without you even knowing it into your face. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> what's What's the transition been like f for you, coming from New York to DC? That's a good question. Thank you. Because it wasn't uh, it wasn't as hard as I question. thought it would be. 
It wasn't as hard <laughs> as I, I mean, in the beginning, it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. Right. I mean, you, you know, you do have a sense of alienation sometimes. And, you, you know, my family is over in New York, and most of my friends coming up New York City. But, um, but when I first came here, people already knew who I was. <laughs> so mm. I was like, whoa, how do they know who I am? And they would come up to me like a Fred Joyner or whatever, you know, and, right. and say... Fred Joyner is a poet in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, and he would, he would, you know, he came up to me at a, at a bookstore reading at Sister Space that was on U Street at the time. This was 2003. And I took my class. My class was supposed to be there. It was a Saturday. And Nikki Finney was in town reading from her latest book at the time, The World is Round. Um, and he came up to me after the, at the end of the reading, and I told him that I was teaching at Howard Creative Writing. He's like, oh, you know, can I, can I come to your class? I'm not a student or anything. I said, yeah, sure. So the class basically opened up to the community, and every poet in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area started crashing the poetry class. And it was kind of reminiscent of um, John Oliver Killens' class at Megra Evers College in New York City in, in Brooklyn where he would give a writer's workshop, but most of the students in his class weren't even matriculated. They weren't <laughs> registered students. And he wasn't supposed to do that, but he did it. And he opened it up as a community workshop. And I think that's cool. So it became a, you know, a community, a family. So it was easy transition. The workshop that you're talking about, people call uh, boot camps for writers. And I call it the boot camp. And, it yeah, is a boot camp for writers. Because it's like, I was in the Army. I know what boot camp is about. It's serious, it's intense. <laughs> Makes you want to slap something. Yeah, I know, I was there. <laughs> and, um, and you know it's broken up in two sections, right? Um, you remember the sections? The hard section, Punks the hard section. Punks jump up to get beat down. Oh, that's right, that's right. I'm, uh, right? That means I forgot. if you, you got to come with something and come correct or you get beat down. Oh, okay, right? I got you. Back it up. <laughs> or, and bitch better have my money is part two. What's bitch better have? You better produce it. you say bitch on YouTube? The, yeah. Okay. And you better meet your deadlines. And you, you know, and I and I told him the first day you walk in this room, right? You automatically identify yourself as a poet, and you act accordingly as a professional poet. Um, the workshops that you're talking about, I was blessed to participate in in 2005, 2006, and they were historic. That was you? Yeah, that was oh, me. Right. You owe me some money. No. <laughs> 2005, 2006 uh, were some historic workshops. Yeah, a lot of uh, people went out to publish uh, and do Derek things. Derek Weston Brown, uh, Randall Horton, Melanie Henderson. I was blessed to be there. Fred Joyner. Fred Joyner, Alan King, Jennifer Steele, Asha French. Uh, Marlene Hawthorne Martha, Thomas. Uh, Dominique. Dominique Hurd, she just, sings and stuff so, in this film. So many writers went off from that workshop David to Rojas. publish. That's, that's right. I remember, yeah, I remember him. Did you plan to have this happen when you came to, to no, how to teach? No, I, I really didn't. I just came to do a gig, you know? I needed a full-time job, and I was blessed to be offered right in the middle of my graduate program to teach at Howard by Dr. Eleanor Trailer, hmm. who is the chair of the English department for a good 15 years, and, you know, it was her mission to transform that place and do something. And she asked me if I would consider teaching at Howard University. At the time, I really didn't want to teach anymore in my life. I did eight years. It's like prison. I did eight jail, years right? in Brooklyn. No, I did an eight-year uh, adjuncting like bid <laughs> uh, at LIU in Brooklyn. Okay. And I was teaching composition, remedial, English, and all that stuff. It was, I was burnt out. Mm -hmm. And graduate school, full fellowship, allowed me up in Binghamton, New York. It allowed me the opportunity, you know, um, to get away from teaching and to focus on my art, you know? And I was burnt out. And then so when, I, when she, she asked me to teach at Howard, I was like so fearful. I was like, oh no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, but I'm getting a PhD, so I'm nuts, right? Why would you be getting a PhD if you don't want to teach anymore, you know? I wanted to just go back to Harlem and chill and write and, and travel and do my thing. You know, my rent was cheap enough to handle it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your rent was cheap in Harlem? Very when, cheap. When was this? Yeah, it was low income housing. This was, I had that. Apartment, oh, I got kicked out, but I had it for 15 years strong. Hmm. But the thing is that um, I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a full-time writer. You know, ever since I wanted to be a writer, I was trying to, like, uh, how do I manipulate this? How do I figure it out? But, of course, that's not to be. But you find that um, when I went to um, 
teach creative writing at Howard, you know, you really affect change. Like that workshop becomes this big thing where you send out all these poets and these new generation people out into the world.